So a rhetorical question to start out here for everybody who is a security practitioner, which is hopefully most of the people in this room. What would you give to the whole security world if you could give anything to the security world? Uh, I've asked myself this a couple times uh, if I had like a magic wand. And for me, the answer is a little bit more certainty. I think that's the thing, the commodity that is most lacking for us in our industry, knowing what the hell is going on. Um, so now some uh, questions you can actually participate in. I want to pull this enormous audience and find out who here builds anything at all on GitHub Actions. Ooh, all right, cool. How about building things you put into production with GitHub Actions? OK. How about building things that help define your infrastructure, like Terraform or you know, maybe some Kubernetes resources, GitOps, that kind of stuff? All right, cool. So let's keep those in mind. Sounds like a lot of people are using GitHub Actions, though, to do some pretty important stuff. This is me. I'm a pointy-haired boss at GitHub. Um, I lead a team called Package Security. I sit on the Sixth or TSC. Um, and people ask me, you know, what does your team do? I don't really understand this stuff. And I tell them that our mission is to make software as safe as seafood. What does that mean, right? Am I just crazy? Um, well, no. Seafood is actually like heavily, heavily regulated. The supply chain for seafood is intense. Screwing it up has massive consequences for individuals, for businesses. Um, you can get sick or die if seafood is, you know, sitting around at too high of a temperature for too long. So from every link in the chain, from the boat to the final consumption, there have to be facts asserted about that thing, right? When was it pulled out of the water? Was it kept at the right temperature on the boat? Kept at the right temperature on the truck? Kept at the right temperature at the distribution facility, right? Now these days they actually have IoT that helps to guarantee this stuff, you know, change, seeing the temperature and then like kicking it out to the, the internet somewhere and kind of attesting to it, right? Bad consequences can happen. In general, we expect a lot from food, um, and most of the time we don't really even think about how protected we are and how much traceability exists in the food system. If you wanted to go and bake a cake today, you'd go to the store, you'd buy your flour, your sugar, your eggs, whatever, you'd come home and you'd start making your cake masterpiece, and you would never ask the question like, hey, is this really flour, or is it maybe 25% sawdust, or maybe it's been adulterated with drain cleaner or cocaine or something like that. You know, it's, no, this is flour, it's pure. I expect it to be pure, right? I'm sitting within a web of regulation and checks and attestations and consequences. I believe this kind of thing, within reason, should be true for software as well. Uh, because these days the enemies aren't just at the gates as they are in this thing that I bought from a stock photo website. Um, they are all over the place. We have threats and dependencies. We have build systems getting compromised. We are moving to a position where we are saying, hey, you really can't trust like, you know, anything that's just inside your perimeter is suddenly is, you know, is definitely trustworthy, I should say. Um, we're moving to a kind of a world where we go to zero trust everything, right? Or at least that's the world we should be moving to. If we know that any link in the supply chain can be compromised, then we need the means to verify at every place in that supply chain. So really, when people ask me what my team does, I say that we basically, in a nutshell, try to create um, tooling that helps people answer this question to their satisfaction. Am I executing the thing that I want to be executing? Or depending on the thing that I want to be depending on? Do I know for sure? So we started to try to solve this problem at GitHub, obviously, um, with the folks that work on our team. And uh, we're gonna get into exactly what we built and sort of why we built it and what we built on top of. Um, and just to take that question and go sort of one click further into the technicals of what it means, what we're trying to do specifically is for any given source uh, software artifact, we want to be able to trace it back to its source code and build instructions. Basically, what we want is to be able to offer a statement of provenance, right? Um, provenance is you know, a statement about where something came from that you can depend on. It's being created by some trusted actor. Um, I don't think anybody in this room is like in a position to go buy a Picasso or something like that, but if you were, it would come with this giant thing of papers basically saying like, this is why we know that this isn't a forgery. This is why we know this is legit, right? That's the concept of provenance and it is an extremely important fundamental concept to trying to secure the software supply chain, right? So really, we are trying to offer capabilities around provenance to pretty much anybody who wants to find that. Why do we need this? Just to jump up and down on these points. 
Um, the single biggest problem in information security all up is implicit trust, right? Right now, our world, unless you're part of a giant corporation that I could name that rebuilds everything from source and their open source dependencies for the most part, um, you're probably just building things straight off of PyPI or RubyGems or whatever, and you are implicitly trusting that the things that you have gotten are definitely good. There's, for the most part in most ecosystems, there's no link from the registry of record back to the originating source code and build instructions, right? So again, jumping up and down on the question, are you executing what you think? Do you know that the code you're running is the code you want to be running? Most of the time, yeah, you don't have a mechanism for finding that out. So, if we're gonna try to offer some more certainty, if we're going to use you know, our, our magic creation wand to create a thing, and we want that thing to be more than good, we want it to be great, what should it look like? We need to write data that can't be forged, which means we need an easy way to make cryptographic signatures happen. We want to bind trust in this stuff that we're building, not to individual humans, where it's really difficult to know that like, hey, this signature associated with this email address is definitely the right signature for the right person at this point in time, but binding trust instead to the workload that produced the artifact. We have a CI CD system called Actions and we want to make it painless for people building with Actions, which is like pretty much everybody in this room at least, to add this to their stuff, right? As one of my colleagues likes to say, we wanna help our users fall into the pit of success. It should be easy, 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 nearly to do this by accident. And then, of course, signing without verifying is completely meaningless theater. You should always be verifying things if you're bothering to sign them. So we need to verify in as many environments as possible with pretty much no effort. And finally, because we're GitHub and it's in our DNA, but also because it's the right thing to do, we want to collaborate with and build on top of open source projects and emerging standards. So what do we have out there in the world that is prior art that can help us out with this? Um, we've got Salsa, which is this great thing to help you reason about um, threats and uh, levels of security that exist within software supply chain security. We've got Intoto, which offers a bunch of cool schemas and tools to kind of operationalize a lot of the concepts that you see inside of Salsa. And then of course you got SigStore, which helps um, make that signature piece, that encryption over the, um, that all important kind of tamper-proof aspect of this, a lot easier than it used to be, right? SigStore aims to be basically let's encrypt, but for software signatures instead of TLS certs. What else do we have in the ecosystem? Well, there is a, in case you don't know, what's called the public good instance, or PGI of SigStore. It is a running instance, it's alive right now, it has tens of millions of signatures from software projects in the open source world. It integrates with a large number of cloud CIs, including uh, GitLab pipelines, BuildKite, GitHub Actions, et cetera. And it represents what I think is actually a unique collaboration between um, a bunch of companies, some of which are otherwise competitors, who are working together to operate a resource in the public good an immutable ledger, a certificate authority, collection of tooling to try to help signatures be kind of democratized and easier to do. Last year, our team worked on a thing where we added provenance to the NPM CLI and server side, making it possible for the first time in a public registry of record to bind an artifact affirmatively that's sitting in the registry back to the thing it came from. So it's not just a line that says, hey, my artifact is associated with this GitHub repo. There is actually a cryptographically verifiable link between those two things. And that's been GA since last September. It's powered by the SIGSTOR PGI, right? So if people are publishing things on NPM and they're using the provenance um, publishing option, that stuff will land on the immutable record ledger that's part of SIGSTOR PGI. And you can go check that out. We've got about 400,000 projects so far um, that are using that, I believe. And it's, uh, it's NPM, so the scale is stupid. It's been downloaded, you know, a tested project's been downloaded several billion times at this point. So it's been reasonably successful. But what we really wanna do is do that for everybody, for anything you build on Actions. We want to give provenance to any artifact that you create. So we have created a thing called Artifact Attestations. Uh, it has been in public beta since May 2nd, and it went GA on Tuesday. What is an attestation? Um, well, Salsa's job is to help us uh, have common definitions for things, and I love this definition. An authenticated statement, metadata, about a software artifact or collection of artifacts. This right here is a chunk of an attestation. Right? So you've got a subject, which is the thing that you are talking about. It's got a name, and it's got a digest. 
and you got a predicate, which is what you are saying about it, right? So we can have a predicate type, in this case, a salsa provenance predicate, um, and then some kind of arbitrary JSON in your predicate data. Cool, so back to what does great look like. We'll go through this list. We want stuff that can't be forged. We wanna make sure that we're binding trust to workloads and not humans. So this is a security architecture that um, basically exists for the quote unquote keyless flow of Sigstor, which is what we're using. So you've got your own workflow here. You are able to call out to a GitHub managed first party workflow. It asks our system for an OIDC token. That token contains a whole bunch of claims data about the running build job and the originating repo and stuff like that. Generate a key pair, you send that token and the public key over to a running SIGSTORE full SEO instance. It mints a cert containing a whole bunch of information from that token and it hands it back to you. Yay, you sign your thing, you throw away your private key because SIGSTORE is based on the idea that um, your signing certs should be temporary and that your, um, there are leaf certs and the intermediates stick around and the root sticks around, but your immediate signing cert only lasts for 10 minutes. Um, you throw that away, you sign, you take your whole thing, you've got a SIG store bundle, it gets stored in some database. So that's the basics of how this flow works. Here's a little bit of what a token, that token you know, kind of transmutes into a cert, but here's some of the stuff that you get out of it. It's really, um, it's, it's kind of revolutionary. In most OIDC tokens, you look at a subject claim, you're gonna see like an email address, right? Because OIDC is probably your most frequently you know, familiar with it from SSO, right? In this case, the subject, as opposed to being an email address, i.e. like a human identity, is actually the repos, um, like the repo org and ref, like the identity coming from the workload. We know which environment it's from, we have some stuff about the IDs uh, that are given by GitHub, the human readable name of the repo. We have the actual specific workflow ref that executed the signature. So this is kind of interesting, you can take this and um, use this to create um, you know, a collection of shared workflows like a lot of people do and say kind of, hey, I want you to sign um, but only using a particular shared workflow that's very popular amongst some of our enterprise customers. And of course the issuer, you know for sure that this came from GitHub and this is the thing that's being checked as part of uh, the flow with Fullstudio to say, you know, is this from a, a token method of trust? Bada bing, it all gets wrapped up, put into an X509 cert and then stuffed into this thing called a six-door bundle and away you go. Um, this is the basic flow, we have a kind of two different um, pieces for, for public and private, right? So if you are building this, it, the customer experience, or user experience is exactly the same um, either way, but if you are writing in a public repo, then we will um, send all that off to the public good instance of SIGSTOR and then all of your um, attestation stuff ends up on the public transparency log. If it's a private repo, we have an internal instance of SIGSTOR and none of your um, you know, proprietary information leaks out anywhere it is all signed with an internal, um, GitHub is now a root CA for signing software and it all will end up landing in um, an internal database. So this is definitely something that you can use um, to attest in public for your open source projects and also crucially it's something you can use for proprietary stuff that is just staying inside the walls of your business, your company, whatever. All right, so what else do we need to do, right? We need to make it painless to generate with actions. So what does that look like? It's really this easy. Add some permissions, do whatever arbitrary stuff you need to do to create your artifact. Um, this if is optional, but I just put this in here as kind of preaching. Uh, since we have rolled this out, some people have, have gone hog wild and started to attest like everything they can get their hands on and attest like every single push they do. And it's really not appropriate. Um, I wrote this in here, this is a snippet out of um, the GitHub CLI's um, workflow kind of saying like, hey, just kind of only attest if you're gonna ship this and you're like, you, it's gonna go out there into the world. Um, our joke on our team right now is we've found several people that are attesting so many things that they're attesting fave icons, um, which is um, probably offering uh, maybe some security benefit that I'm unaware of, but yeah, for the most part, it's, um, it is, that's the reaction that we've had as well, just, uh, yeah, don't attest your fave icons. Um, and then at the end of it, it's all just actions. The entire attestation kit is just actions. And I should say, you can get, um, we have actions attest build provenance, but also, I know SBOMs are super popular, but also no one really definitely knows how to build them except for a few people who've like taken the trouble to do it for their environment. So if you are building an SBOM and you just want a way to associate that thing with a single built artifact, we also have an action that does the same basic thing, 
It will take your SBOM that you hand us, it will wrap it up in an Intoto predicate, and it will assign it and associate it with the same subject digest as your um, build provenance. So you can have a signed SBOM living in, in the store as well, if that's something that you're interested in. Yes, and verifiable. Now, I can't verify that the contents of the SBOM are correct. That is a uh, much harder problem. Um, but if you want to have an SBOM, um, we are happy to sign the SBOM you give us. Um, if you're new to SBOMs, we suggest in our documentation, take a look at SIFT. It's pretty good at stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, we, we tried to sort of sidestep the question of like how to give you a great SBOM right away. Um, and just say like, if you're building one and you, and you wanna have it in the database, then, then you can associate it with an artifact, which is very valuable on its own. Um, so once you have all of that, this is some kind of diving in a little bit to like what a provenance attestation looks like. So these external and internal parameter stanzas come from Salsa. We are dividing up um, like what things are controlled by the user, right? So that's external parameters, like technically, you know, which repository this runs on and like which um, workflow YAML is actually being executed. That's a user choice. You have that under your control. Then internal parameters are within the control of the system only, right? So you have no control over like what auto-generated ID GitHub hands to you when you create a new repository or is associated with your owner ID. Um, and then you have really cool stuff like the resolved dependencies um, stanza that in, gives you the commit that all of this was triggered by. So this is going, taking you all the way back to um, that particular repo, this particular commit actually triggered this build. And then of course you have the build run itself. So you can get straight back to this information. Um, you can get straight back to all the information about the build run from this URL that's captured in here, right? So pretty powerful right away, the Providence attestation gives you all of this stuff. What does it look like to verify? This is gonna be a little bit of a letdown. It's really this simple. Yes, we could not make it any easier than this. Um, we tried, we couldn't get there. We realized that if we didn't require you to have pre-knowledge of the org, we were kind of setting ourselves up for like a DOS scenario, although we might eventually set up something that allows you to like look something up only by a digest. Um, but yeah, what this is doing is it's going to say, um, I wanna verify and then you give it a path. The path can be an artifact on disk or it can be um, a, uh, like an OCI URL for a registry that you've got access to, it'll take either one. Then you give it the dash O flag, give it the org um, that it came from and then it's that easy. It will pull the attestation down. Well, what it'll do is it'll digest that artifact. In the case of a container image, it'll do the needful to pull down the manifest and do digesting. And then it will look it up in our database, it'll pull the information and it'll verify it for you. So we'll show you that in a minute when we do a demo. Um, we also have new for the GA, um, the Kubernetes modality, which is basically um, a distribution of the upstream SIG store policy controller, which has already existed for a while, and is there to help you um, do policy evaluation when you are pulling workloads into your environment. So if you want to run container images that were definitely signed by your organization within a given namespace, we've got you covered. That's what it does right out of the box. So. Um, we offer Helm charts that will help you set up um, the trust routes for SIGSTOR PGI and for the GitHub internal one for private workloads, um, and then away you go. So our kind of interviews with customers basically said in 99% of, of cases, people are just looking to be able to ensure that the container image they're bringing into a particular namespace was absolutely signed by their organization, which this does, but then if you read the documentation for SIGSTOR policy controller, it's very powerful. You can actually do other things beyond that. You can say, hey, I wanna have an SBOM, or I wanna have a, you know, a predicate, uh, a, sorry, maybe like a Voln scanning thing that, um, that's you know, a Voln scan result that's you know, um, younger than X number of days old or whatever. Because all of this is JSON, I should say, it's extremely amenable to sort of policy-based evaluation, right? So um, it supports, um, I believe the policy controller supports both Rego and Q out of the box for like defining policies um, inside there for your cluster. Um, there's a lot going on in the policy controller that I can't really dive into too much in this talk, but we've got guides and documentation online about it. Do you have a class Sorry? We, we can dive into, into questions in a minute, but those kinds of things are possible, sure. Um, so then the last bit of what GREAT looks like, collaborating with open source projects and standards. Um, you know, obviously we have been building this stuff on top of SIGSTOR, which in turn is kind of built on top of things from Intoto, things from Salsa, and um, leverages uh, Tuff, the update framework, um, for managing the trust route, right? So 
um, we the the CLI and the um, policy controller both we kind of ship the trust root data out of band so that you can um, verify things and you can keep up with um, changes in the intermediate cert. We roll the intermediate certs for the GitHub CA every six months, um, and so you don't have to do anything extra because you have the tough trust root in place. There, a lot of things are just kind of handled for you. Um, obviously, NPM, which um, we we own, we have you know kind of already done some things um, to get. Uh, provenance attestations into NPM. Um, but super exciting is the fact that Homebrew, um, which as folks here may know, um, Homebrew has, uh, has taken, this, um, taken this on too. Homebrew, everything is built, um, every like, pre-compiled binary for Homebrew, which is called a bottle, is built on GitHub Actions and it all comes out of one org. So um, interestingly, and this will, this will be important in a moment when we do the demo, um, if you're a Homebrew user, and you have installed anything since about late April, you already have attested packages sitting in the package cache on your Mac right now. Um, and so what, I'll, show you, I'll show you what that looks like in a moment when you do a demo. Um, but right now, every single pre-compiled binary in all of Homebrew is, has an attestation on it. And you can enforce attestations at install time. Um, and it, it, right now, it shells out to GH, and so you have to have kind of like a um, you know, fully ready uh, GH CLI tool there on the box. We will be working over time to, to sort of take away um, that requirement um, as we get SIG stores uh, support for Ruby pulled up. But um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to see more and more um, ecosystems kind of start to do some of these same things. Um, we're excited to see uh, what's going on in PyPI and RubyGems. There's uh, several other ecosystems that are starting to um, build in support for the registries of record uh, for provenance. And um, yeah, we're, we're very excited about this. We've spent a lot of time um, working on SIGStore, working to um, build some automation stuff around Tuff, um, engaging on um, some of the, the newer things in Salsa, like the source provenance track. Um, we offered some new stuff into doing Toto as well. And to kind of echo what Chris said in his opening statement, if you were there at the keynote, um, you know, we all have, I think, a duty to try to bring forward the state of the art within um, open source. And we all, well, for the most part, I think all of us probably have day jobs that are not directly in line with that goal. So a lot of what I try to um, manage within, within GitHub is um, this notion that we can pretty frequently find like um, reasons to do the right thing for open source, even if those things kind of emanate from customer requirements or emanate from kind of the enterprise world. It's, the goals are not as, uh, as orthogonal or in, as, in opposition as they might seem. So that's kind of my little public service announcement is like try to find reasons to do the right thing for open source, even if those reasons are kind of enterprisey. And, um, those aren't as misaligned as you might think. Okay, should we do a demo? Do people want to follow along and demo themselves as well? You can. Um, I am happy to have that be the case. So what I'm gonna do here is um, jump over to my terminal. Um, and you see all the garbage on my desktop. All right, so right now I am in um, library. Can we see this or I need to make this much bigger? Is that better? Yeah, okay. So um, we're gonna see here, we're gonna find an instance of um, GH, the GH CLI tool, right? So this is a cache for Homebrew. When you download stuff for Homebrew, all this stuff's gonna land in here for a little bit. And so what do we have? All right, cool. We have this long bottle name tarball. Um, now let us, I don't actually know what this thing is, but it is, I think it's like a digest of like the homebrew recipe that built the thing, because it's not the digest of this, right? Let's, let's just take um, this and find out what the digest is. Okay, so the digest starts 798 and ends with O2E, right? That's the digest of a tar, again, a tarball of the GitHub CLI tool that has been installed previously on this computer with homebrew, right? Cool, okay, so, we, in, in my case, I've already got GH um, on the machine and it's ready to talk to GitHub. So I'm gonna look again into my history and run this command. Attestation, verify, I am giving it dash O, capital H, homebrew, because homebrew has a capital letter and um, thus far we're, we're not yet case insensitive on these things. Um, and we are giving it the file path, right? So we'll do that. I like to keep my token inside one password, which is a good practice and instead of on the box. So now it's, it's looked it up, it has computed that same digest, and I was just trying to uh, sort of show you that like the digest that you see here that we computed with OpenSSL, uh, OpenSSL is the same digest 
that you see here that is computed by the GHCLI tool. So it's gonna compute the digest of the thing on disk, it's gonna use that plus the org name to look it up in our API, right? Then it does a whole bunch of um, fairly cryptographically complex um, checks. The SIG store verification process is, is non-trivial um, to find out a whole bunch of, to ask a whole bunch of questions to find out whether or not this is legit. And you end up with it saying like, hey, I have attested this thing, um, you know, just so happens that matches the same thing up there. Again, just sort of showing that that's true. It came from this repo. It's, you know, the, the thing that you're looking at is this kind of provenance predicate and this workflow right here, GitHub workflows like publish, um, is uh, the thing that originated this, right? Which is pretty cool. That's immediately what you get out of the CLI tool. The attestation command also itself will give you, um, there's a few other things in the subcommand. There's verify, but there's also download, which will let you use it in offline mode. Um, and then we're working on kind of like an inspect tool as well to help you like look at details of certificates like a little more cleanly. Um, but it also does, um, I, I should also show you, I think, a little bit. I've downloaded one here and I wanna dive in um, to what is in this uh, particular, what is in an attestation that I've kind of downloaded earlier just to show you a little bit more. So um, we grab the attestation, we look inside the chunk of JSON called the Dizzy envelope, the payload inside that which is base64 encoded and so that's, you can see here, I'm, I'm kind of just showing the whole thing. So this is a whole bunch of information, right, coming out of, out of the thing, um, out of the downloaded attestation. We're just sort of processing it with JQ. And so, again, you can see the stuff that I was showing earlier in the slides, right? You've got the build type, you've got the parameters, you've got the originating commit, um, you've got all of this stuff. And if we want to, we can click on the invocation ID and just hop right over and take a look at what's going on here. That's my good buddy Andy who triggered this build. You can sort of just dig through this whole thing and kind of look around at any of the information that, that might be um, interesting to you as part of the build, right? So you're able to jump straight from the thing on disk all the way back to the originating, um, originating build job and interrogate the thing. And this is incredibly powerful if you want to build any kind of policy at all. You can take um, that same, you know, you can take like a, write an OPA rule in Rego and you can process to your heart's content. You can decide I only want to trust these things or I only care about, um, you know, I, I care about things from these five organizations are the only places allowed or, you know, these repos are approved for production or sort of whatever you want to do, you're able to do this because again, we have a binding taking you all the way back to the beginning. So that's the demo. Um, and I wanted to leave y'all with this, this uh, notion of um, a cultural shift I don't like eating like food right off the ground. Um, I have this hamburger metaphor that I've tortured to death, which is why I decided to use the seafood thing this time. Um, but I don't think any of us would go and just be like, oh, food, and just grab it and eat it unless you were in some like serious duress, right? And I feel like we have kind of been doing that all this time with software, and it's time to move towards just expecting to know where things come from. There's a tremendous number of implied security benefits from that, but it's also just sort of like a hygiene thing. Like, hey, if I'm bringing this into my build or I'm putting it onto my servers or I'm giving it to my customers, I should have you know, quite a bit more information about it. I should expect to have more information. Ultimately, we should be demanding this as a community. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me talk. And yeah, I think I've got some more time. I'd be happy to answer questions. Do, this question is, and I'm just doing this for the YouTube, uh, do I see the uh, salsa generator being replaced by the GitHub action? Um, it's, you know, to be honest, it's not clear to me exactly how and whether those things will be maintained over the long term. Um, and so part of what we have to do is, you know, GitHub has this constant and I think very useful tension um, between the fact that like we are kind of the de facto home of the world's open source and we're also a business. Right, and so, you know, the same thing that we're building to give to the open source world, um, you know, in kind of the classic GitHub model, we're, we're giving this away for free to open source projects, and then this is, you know, this is something that our enterprises are paying us for, enterprise customers are paying us for. So we have to, when we have that tension, we have to sort of um, make sure that the stuff that we are offering uh, to customers, th there's not like a, a long link, uh, or sorry, a long chain of links um, between like us and the offering, right? So. Um, as part of this, like, we, we kind of, 
we, we, we asked ourselves, you know, did, when we looked at what does great look like, we kind of asked ourselves, like, is that salsa generator one as, as usable as it could be? And we felt like there were maybe some opportunities there that, that, um, that we weren't able to take advantage of. And um, two, you know, are we able to continue to rely a whole lot on one particular community and not just put our arms around this and bring it in? And, and most of the time we would, we would rather um, like I said, build on top of the, the grassroots stuff. Um, but I will say that as, you know, as part of this work, um, we, there is a community schema for kind of binding um, GitHub actions to um, Salsa provenance and sort of saying, well, this field in the token becomes this thing in the Salsa provenance, kind of the mapping. And we actually had to kind of fork that and take it over and bring some new things in there that weren't yet in that. And so I don't, I, that's an open question for me, right? I know also, you know, uh, the world is what it is, and the, the salsa team has, um, you know, not stayed static. Uh, shall we say there are some folks that were there a few uh, months ago that are no longer there. So yeah, it's uh, I I would in a perfect world we'd be able to just build completely on top of that, and everything would be great. But it was uh, it just wasn't in the cards for us. I think. The question is, do we have a roadmap for um, attesting more about um, dependencies, where the dependencies came from, um, that kind of thing? And yeah, the answer is yes. Um, not really ready to discuss too much about that. But um, I can say, because it's on the public roadmap, that we are going to be making GitHub releases optionally immutable in the future, and that that is built on top of attestations as well. So you'll, um, you'll have, if you choose to turn that on for a given repo, you produce a release, the um, artifacts within that release will be bound um, to a particular uh, to that repo, that git shot, that kind of thing. And so there will be, um, you know, there will be a, a concept of total immutability for releases so that you can rely on the fact that that artifact won't change out from underneath you, right? Like right now, GitHub releases and, and git tags are sort of like inextricably bound. And obviously git tags are inherently mutable. Um, so we needed to kind of have this foundation of the signing tools available before we could do that. But that's um, something that people have asked for as well. Are you also going to have the salsa level There is no salsa level four. Sure, <laughs> there used to be a salsa level four. Um, and uh, to hit that level, we would need to um, be able to do some, uh, some fun stuff with, with actions networking, which um, is, is being considered as well. But yeah, I should say, if you're interested in salsa levels um, as regards this thing, since, since you brought it up, um, artifact attestations are level two if you insert it directly into your workflow. If what you do instead is you write a shared workflow and then you call that, the nature of actions is such that that shared workflow, the signing bit of this, is guaranteed to run on separate hardware from the rest of the build. And so we're saying that that meets Salsa level three, right? So you can get to Salsa level three pretty easily with this. You just need to author a shared workflow, put the attestation invocation inside that shared workflow, and then in your repo that's doing the building, invoke the shared workflow instead of directly invoking the attestation action, then you'll be at level three. Any other questions? Kyle, yeah. Yep, you can list the attestations. Um, there's a UI for it as well under the actions tab on the left side. You can click on uh, attestations and see all the ones for that repo. Um, we, we're going to be iterating on the user experience of that too. Um, but yeah, you can pull the attestations. The, the kind of wrinkle here is uh, because ver doing the verif full verification flow for SIGSTOR is pretty non-trivial. Um, we have a lot of people saying, well, I just want to grab the attestations. And we're saying, that's fine. But remember that like having them is not enough. You have to verify them, right? Because again, signing without verifying is meaningless. Um, so yeah, there's the API is documented. Just you know, it's the same way that all of our other stuff is documented with, like, with Open API. But there's kind of a warning saying like, you really do need a plan to verify these if you want to pull them and stash them somewhere. Um, I should also probably mention that you can optionally push attestations um, directly into an OCI registry, no matter whether it's about a uh, an artifact on disk or a container image. It doesn't have to be a container image for you to do that. Um, so that makes the policy controller sort of plug and play because you don't have to go like take a runtime dependency on GitHub in order to have these. You can just, your build job that creates the attestation can just send it off to an OCI registry of your choice. Um, so the attestations are available in a few different ways. 
We are also um, continuing to iterate a little bit on the air gap story. Um, if, you, if you look at the latest version of the, of the CLI tool, you'll see that there is no more beta warning on the verification subcommand, but there still is a, a beta warning on the download one because we're kind of working on some, on some bits there to make it, um, to make the kind of download, download and use it later experience kind of a little bit more rationalized um, as, as we go forward. Uh, the question is, do we already have something for container images hosted on, on, uh, on GitHub? Yeah. yeah. Um, when you say have something, I'm sorry. What? Just a way to directly verify containers uh, rather than pointing to the stuff. Um, yeah, so when you're, right, so you can point to the URL. And when you're, when you're running the verification command, you can, you can do the URL of your registry. And if you have access to the, it just works. If you have access, if, you, if you've got a session to the registry, it'll just, it'll do the needful there. Because um, really what's happening is it's actually pulling a manifest file, because that's the way signing for container images works. And then it's doing the verification from there. Um, but yeah, it works seamlessly with, with any artifact on disk or with a registry. And it doesn't, we, we fully support um, pretty much all the registries you can think of, whether they, uh, it, it's nice if they support OCI 1.1, um, but even the ones that have weird little warts like uh, ECR and stuff like that, we've kind of done the necessary stuff to smooth that out. So whether you're using something that conforms strictly to the distribution standard or you're using something that kind of doesn't, it should work anyway. Unless it's super obscure and non-conforming, I can't guarantee that, but the things that are non-conforming are in really wide use, definitely already, already works with. Any other questions? All right, thanks so much for coming out.